Peace to you in the name of our Lord Jesus Christ, and welcome to the sixth season of Guerrilla Christianity. My name is Pastor Brett Walker, and I want to thank you for listening to Guerrilla Christianity, an unconventional, no apologies exposition of God's Holy Word. And right now we want to get right into God's Word, so let's go. Please remain standing for the reading of God's Holy Word from the Gospel according to St. Luke, uh, chapter 2 and beginning at verse 41. Let us hear the word of the Lord for us today. Now his parents went to Jerusalem every year at the feast of the Passover. And when he was 12 years old, they went up to Jerusalem after the custom of the feast. And when they had fulfilled the days, as they returned, the child Jesus tarried behind in Jerusalem, and Joseph and his mother knew not of it. But they, supposing him to have been in the company, went a day's journey, and they sought him among their kinsfolk and acquaintance. And when they found him not, they turned back to Jerusalem seeking him. And it came to pass that after three days, they found him in the temple, sitting in the midst of the doctors, both hearing them and asking them questions. And all that heard him were astonished at his understanding and answers. And when they saw him, they were amazed. And his mother said unto him, Son, why hast thou thus dealt with us? Behold, thy father and I have sought thee sorrowing. And he said unto them, How is it that ye sought me? Wist ye not that I must be about my father's business? And they understood not the saying which he spake unto them. And he went down with them, and came to Nazareth, and was subject unto them. But his mother kept all these sayings in her heart. And Jesus increased in wisdom and stature, and in favor with God and man." May God pour out His rich blessing upon this, the reading of His holy word. You may be seated. Today we're going to conclude our sermon series, uh, Prepare the Way. There's actually one more sermon in the series, but I won't be here to deliver it, so you're not getting it. (laughs) Uh, uh, Well, in the first week, which was the first week of Advent... Uh, the word that we focused on was stand. Uh, We looked at Jesus' prophecy uh, when he said um, for us to stay righteous so that we could stand in the presence of the Son of Man when he returns. Uh, Jeremiah's prophecy of the new covenant, we looked at that as well. In the second week, we looked at the word refine. And in Malachi's uh, prophecy, he said... He, who, who may abide the day of His coming? Who can stand when He appears? For He is like a refiner's fire and like a fuller's soap. Uh, refining or sanctification is an act of the Holy Spirit in us. We are not the refiners of our lives, but God, through the Holy Spirit, refines us as, uh, as a refiner does with gold. In the third week, uh, the focus was on the word do. What do we do? Uh, The people came to John the Baptist and they said to him, what shall we do? And he told them. What we found out was what we do is not to change completely who we are, but continue in what we do, but do it honorably. God meets us right where we are. He said to the tax collectors, Okay, tax collecting, uh, people don't like you because you, you, you extort money, uh, you, you skim off the top, you're cheats, but okay, continue to be tax collectors, but do it in an honorable way. Don't cheat. Don't take more than what you're owed, you know. Uh, for the soldiers who are the, uh, the, the, the temple guards, don't extort money, don't bully people, be guards of, of God's holy temple, but do it in an honorable way. Be exactly where we are, we are called to be where we are, and to honor God in everything that we do. In the fourth week, which was last Sunday... We talked about welcome. We, we looked at Mary visiting Elizabeth and how uh, the baby leaped in the womb of Elizabeth when she greeted Mary, the, the mother of the Lord. And we were, uh, we were talking about people in the community, how we can welcome them in our Christmas Eve service, how we can 
welcome people from uh, the community who are not ordinarily here, but they are seeking, seeking or searching for something. And we, 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 we had our Christmas Eve service, and we talked about how Christ arrived there in Bethlehem. He will arrive again one day at the end of all things, and how we are preparing ourselves, preparing the way for His coming. This week, the focus is going to be on the word search. Only in Luke do we see the growth of Jesus as a young as a young person, as a child, rather than just going from being a baby to an adult, as he does in Matthew's gospel or in Mark and uh, John's gospel. He starts; uh, they start with his adult ministry. Only Luke addresses this uh, event that happens in his adolescence, as it were. And we've already read the text. Let's uh, prepare our hearts and minds to receive uh, God's holy word for us today. Father of light, send forth your spirit into our midst. Pour out your spirit upon us and renew us that we may receive this word today and welcome your word made flesh into the world and into our lives. For we ask it in Jesus' name. Amen. Think back to when you were a child. You go to Sunday school uh, in church. You know, Sunday school did not begin as what it is has morphed into today. Today, uh, Sunday school is really focusing on lessons of the Bible. We read Bible stories, you know, um, and sometimes we, we, we may have even read this particular story about Jesus as a child because it helps children to identify with Jesus as Savior. To think of him as a child helps us too. Uh, Of course, Sunday school didn't start out um, as what we have it today. Sunday school actually was school. In the 19th century, uh, a lot of children didn't go to school past a certain age. Uh, They would go to work at a certain age. And so on Sundays, they would come to church and the church took it upon themselves to educate the children. There, is a, there was a concerted focus on educating the children in light of uh, the Word of God. Not just that they were learning the Bible, but also learning how to live life uh, with, the, with the Word of God as their backdrop. You know, for their whole lives. And we've really gotten away from that, haven't we? we we've, we've gotten very far away from that nowadays. I hear parents these days say, well, I don't want to impose my beliefs on my children. Why not? Why wouldn't you? What, I mean, you want to raise your children to be, uh, to believe in the things that you believe in. You want your children to be raised in an atmosphere. You're demonstrating for them They're learning from you whether you want to impose your beliefs on them or not. Uh, They are learning from you what is important to you. Uh, They they look at you. they, they, They look at you for guidance. What do we prioritize as adults? In Jesus' time and in the centuries before that even, all the way back to the book of Deuteronomy, uh, the people of uh, the Jewish people thought it was very, 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 very important that they raise their children to know God. In fact, in Deuteronomy chapter 6, Moses says to the people uh, to remember these words, the words of this law, uh, keep them on your hearts, bind them you know, on your heads and on your hands, so they're always with you. Put them on your do- the doorposts of your house, so that you always have those words going in and coming out. And and also to teach them to your children diligently. When you when you raise in the morning, when you sit down at at dinner, always be talking about your life with God. And we've gotten way, way, way far away from that, haven't we? I mean. We need to be uh, raising our children and talking to them. When's the last time uh, that we spoke to our children, either adult children or uh, little children, maybe even grandchildren? When's the last time we actually sat down and talked to them about our relationship with God through Jesus Christ? About who God is in our lives? You know, we need to be raising our children 
Because if we're not raising our children to know God, somebody out there is going to tell them what they should believe. And it's not going to be in keeping with God's words. Believe me. Uh, there, I mean, they, kids get these inf- this information from a lot of different sources, from their friends at school, from, from the internet. When I was a youth leader, uh, kids used to come to me with all these sorts of questions. And, and good questions, don't get me wrong, but questions based in error because they were told something, either they read something on the internet or a friend of theirs told them something that they heard from somebody else. You know, if we don't teach our children, somebody else will. I'll give you an example of what I'm talking about. Why do we celebrate Christmas on December 25th? Does anybody know? Why do we celebrate Christmas on December 25th? Well, as we all know, uh, the... December 25th was established as the day that we would celebrate Christmas by Emperor Constantine. Now, Emperor Constantine was a, he was a, uh, a pagan and he converted to Christianity late in his life. But as a pagan Roman emperor, he decided to take the pagan holidays and convert them into Christian holidays. And actually, December 25th is the, the feast of Saturnalia. And so he, uh, he took this pagan pagan holiday and converted it into a uh, Christian holiday, right? We all know this. It's not true. It's not true. I don't know how I can tell you this enough. It is not true. That did not happen, okay? But that's what it says on the internet. And if it says it on the internet, it's got to be right, right? You know, Abraham Lincoln, I think it was, who said, don't believe everything you read on the internet. So... (laughs) Listen, here, here's, here's the real deal, okay? I'm going to tell you why we celebrate Christmas on the 25th. And this is the truth, okay? I'm not messing with you at all, all right? In the first century, understand that when Jesus was born, there was no scribe standing there going, oh, this is the Son of God, and this is the day that he was born, December 25th in the year one, Right? There wasn't anybody around doing that. So after he was born, after he had his ministry, after he was crucified and then resurrected, and after the Gospels came out, all these eyewitness accounts of people uh, writing about the things that Jesus had done, things people were still alive uh, who had seen those things, and nobody disputed those things. But after these uh, Gospels were written, then people started to go, you know, we really want to know when, when was Jesus born? Actually, the thing that they really wanted to know was when did Jesus die? That was the thing that was most important to most of the Christians in the first century, the very beginning part of the second century. And why was that important? Because a prophet, it was believed in the first century, uh, the Jews believed that a prophet would die, a prophet of God would die on the anniversary of the day that he was conceived. Isn't that fascinating? So if a child was conceived on a particular day and that child became a prophet of God, he would die on the anniversary of the day he was conceived. Because they had, they had this belief. They went and they searched and they researched and they came up with a date of the death of Jesus, which was March 25th. They looked at, they looked at um, uh, Passover and the history of Passover and when Passover went against the Roman calendar now. Okay, And so March 25th was the date that they arrived at through a lot of research, through a lot of uh, clues that are in the text of the Bible. And so if... He, Jesus died on March 25th. That means that he was conceived on March 25th. And if you take March 25th and add nine months, what do you get? December 25th. Right? We're talking about the first century. This is even before Constantine was born. All right? Christians were already recognizing December 25th as the day Jesus was born. And it became the day of Christ's Mass. 
And it was a 12-day celebration that went from December 25th, or actually December 24th. And why do we do uh, Christmas Eve? Is because of the Jewish tradition that the day begins at sundown, right? So we have Christmas Eve, which begins Christ's Mass, which goes on for 12 days, 12 days of Christmas, and ends on the 6th of January, which is the day of Epiphany. Okay? And we put to bed all of those myths about Christians trying to uh, take over the pagan holidays. It has nothing to do with that. It has everything to do with the day that he died and the day that he was conceived. And it stands to reason, December 25th is as good a day as any to celebrate the birth of our Lord. But see, this is the kind of thing that our children are being told out there in the world. And if we aren't careful, they're going to hear those things and it's going to drive them off their faith. If we don't build a deep, deep foundation for them as children... They will have a very shallow foundation and their house will be built on sand. We don't want that for our children. We want them to have a deep foundation on the rock, the rock of Jesus Christ. We want their understanding to be based in the truth of God's holy word. It was quite an introduction, wasn't it? I didn't really mean to go all that far into the 25th, but that's okay. Um, What I do want to talk to you about, though, is a... Uh, a movie that we often see every year. I think, I think it 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 had it won a, a a couple Academy Awards. If it didn't win a couple, I think it won at least one. You know, for Best Picture of all time. Uh, and that movie is called Home Alone. Have you ever seen it? Have you ever seen this movie? It's a great movie, right? Everybody I know has seen this movie, and they all say the same thing. How in the world could you? possibly forget a child at home, right? Well, if you watch the movie, it's, it's like a perfect storm, literally a perfect storm of things that occur, right? Uh, Kevin is disobedient. He's sent to go up into the attic, right? He, he sleeps in the attic, which apparently is not a bad thing, you know, but he sleeps in the attic. The next day, uh, the overnight, uh, a tree branch falls on a power line. The power goes out. They sleep through their alarm, which, by the way, happened to me this morning. You should have seen me this morning running around. Um, and they, they slept through the alarm. Uh, then they're all running around, and uh, all these people are, and what do they do? They, they're counting heads. Count heads. Boom, 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 boom. And they count all of the heads, but one of the heads that they count is the neighbor kid who's standing there with his back turned. And so they think, well, we have everybody. Then they're running through Chicago O'Hare Airport, which is a great scene. And if you've ever been in Chicago O'Hare Airport, you come to that part in the airport w- where they filmed it, and you go, wow, this is really cool. This is where they filmed it, you know. Um, Neither here nor there. And they, they get on a plane, and, and then the mom is sitting there, and she's going, like moms do, I, I feel like we're forgetting something. I, what are we... And she's like going through her checklist, right? Uh, as we're, by the way, we're, we're preparing for a journey ourselves. You know, in two days' time, we're going to be driving down to Florida. Um, very excited about it. Um, we have a very precise method of of packing and preparing and the method goes like this Erin does the packing and I stay out of the way okay (laughs) she has this enormous list of things that we're going to be taking with us my job is just to pack it into the car you know when the time comes but anyway so here's the mother uh, going, mm, I feel like I forgot something. And the dad's going, well, did you leave the iron on? No, that wasn't it. Did you leave the microwave open? Uh, open? I don't know, that wasn't it. Did you, did you close the garage door? I didn't close the garage door. Well, there you go. And uh, da, 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 da. That's great. And then all of a sudden she goes, Kevin! Right? She forgets. That's the thing that she forgot. Her child. <laughs> right? Well, we see that <laughs> in today's uh, text. Uh, But notice that it says in verse 41, his parents went to Jerusalem every year at the Feast of Passover. And this is so important for us as parents to establish these patterns of worship, to show our children that worship is important to us. That that Sunday is a day, it's the Lord's day, isn't it? We, we, We celebrate, every Sunday is like a little Easter. 
Uh, we remember the resurrection of the Lord. And, and this is the day when we come together, we devote first things to God. The first tithe of our increase. The, the first day of the week. The first hour of the day. Devote those things to God and let your children see that they are devoted to God. That, that God is the priority in your life. His parents went to Jerusalem every year at the Feast of the Passover. When he was 12 years old, they went up to Jerusalem after the custom of the feast. They, they go up every year, and so they go up when he's 12. Uh, when they had fulfilled the days, as they returned, the child Jesus tarried behind in Jerusalem, and Joseph and his mother knew not of it. But they, supposing him to have been in the company, went a day's journey, and they sought him among their kinsfolk and acquaintance. Okay, so, little cultural um, uh, lesson here. People in the time of Jesus did not travel alone. There was, uh, you know, Aaron and Isaac and I are going to be driving down in one car. They didn't have, you know, the woody wagon that they could all pile into and drive down to Jerusalem, right? Which would have been less than a day's journey. It would have been about an hour's drive, okay? But by foot, it's a couple of days, all right? Um, so what would they do? It's not safe to travel. It's not safe to be out at night in a strange place. So they would travel in groups. Uh, the whole community, uh, every year it was required for the men of, uh, the, the, the Jewish men to attend three festivals every year. Sometimes the women would go, uh, especially the more pious or religious women, uh, and only if their family duties would allow for them to travel. Uh, and what, the way they would travel is the women would travel in the front, the men would travel in the rear, and at night they would break down into their family units, but they would also be together as a group so they couldn't be, um, you know, attacked by bandits, for example, on the road, uh, that sort of thing. So the first night, after they had traveled a day away from Jerusalem, they went, they were looking for Jesus. They thought, you know, Mary probably thought, well, he's with his dad. <laughs> Joseph is going, he's with Mary. Uh, or maybe they were just thinking that he was in the middle of the pack, playing with the children, whatever. And they did not find him. They turned back again to Jerusalem seeking him. Now do the math. They, drove, they walked for a day. They did a day's journey away from Jerusalem. How long is it going to take them to get back to Jerusalem? A day, right? So that's two days right there. And it came to pass that after three days, they've been three days without the Son of God. They know, by the way, he's, a, he's an exceptional child. He's not your ordinary child. Mary is told that the, 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 the Most High will overshadow her and that he will be called the Son of God. And Joseph is also told this in a dream, that he will be Son of God. So they're thinking to themselves, he is the Son of God. We lost the Son of God, okay? Right? Can you imagine? So this is the third day now. They find him in the temple, sitting in the midst of the doctors. They probably, when they got back to Jerusalem, the first place they went was a the marketplace. They went to where there, were, there would be children. And then finally they said, well, okay, let's go back to the temple. They went back to the temple, retraced their steps, and they found him there. And he was talking to the men of learning. And all that heard him were astonished at his understanding and answers. I often picture... Like, what kind of things was Jesus talking to them about at the age of 12, you know? Uh, 12-year-olds have great questions, by the way. I, as a youth leader, I got asked a lot of really great questions, tough, hard questions. But I don't think it was like they were, he was asking questions to seek answers, but to make them think. Think about that. Think about the questions that Jesus asked of the Pharisees and the Sadducees. Why do you say that the Messiah is the son of David? Okay. Why do you say that he is David's son when David himself said, The Lord said to my Lord, sit at my feet until I make your enemies your footstool. He said, if David called him Lord, then how can he be his son? Right. Understanding that uh, the Jewish understanding was that the ancestors or the descendants uh, 
the descendants of somebody were lesser than those that, the ancestors that came before them. So David's son would be lesser than him, and David's grandson would be lesser than him, and so on and so forth. But here is David in the Holy Spirit saying, the Lord said to my Lord. He's calling him my Lord. And so that was a question that Jesus asked to the Pharisees and Sadducees. I wonder if this is the same kind of question that he was asking to the, uh, the men of learning, the doctors as it were. So, when they saw him, they were amazed. And his mother said to him, well, let me get, i, I got to tell, tell you a story real quick. So, when my, uh, my older kids were young, all right, I think um, uh, Rob was about nine Katie was about 10, I would say. We went down to the Cape May Zoo. Uh, uh, Cape May Zoo is great. It's a great place to go. It's free. <laughs> you know, that's one of the reasons why it's so great. But it's also a beautiful zoo. I mean, Kohansic is a nice zoo and it's free also, but it's not what the Cape May Zoo is. Cape May Zoo is just fantastic. It's, it's big. It's sprawling. I actually like it a lot better than the Philadelphia Zoo. And it's free. So, so we went there a lot. Um, and we took the kids, and you know, at the end, after you go through the zoo, you have to go into the gift shop. Now, the gift shop at the, at the Cape May Zoo there used to be, I don't know if it still is, but it used to be really tiny. I Like, it was just two little aisles, um, and we went in there, and it was a warm day, it was a beautiful day, and it was crowded in the, uh, the gift shop. So, there was a point where I was standing there and I looked down the aisle and I saw my son Rob standing there and then I turned back and I was talking to Aaron and I turned back and he was gone. Okay? Just like that. He was gone. And so I walked down the aisle and I looked down the other aisle and he wasn't there and I'm looking around and I'm going, all of a sudden, I mean, I could feel the adrenaline kick in, right? And I could feel like all the blood draining out of my face. I'm like, I'm like, I lost my son. So I went outside and I'm looking, I'm doing this, like the scanning thing. I'm scanning everybody and I'm like, I'm not seeing them. And I'm calling out to him. I'm going, Rob, Rob, Rob. You know, and, and I'm, I'm freaking out at this point. And then over the loudspeaker, I hear a woman's voice say, uh, would the parents of Rob Walker, Robbie Walker, please come to the front gate. And so I went to the gate and there he was. And the first thing I said was, why did you wander away from us? And I wasn't really mad at him, was I? I was just, I was more mad at myself. But I was freaking out. And so all that emotion came out with, why did you go away? You know, and, and so that, I told you all that to tell you this. So Mary said, Son, why hast thou thus dealt with us? Behold, thy father and I search, sought for thee, sorrowing. <laughs> well, it wasn't really Jesus' fault. It wasn't really their fault either. But that word sorrowing, oh my goodness. Um, I, I, I know you love it when I do the Greek lessons, right? So uh, I looked it up this week and the word, because that word is actually translated in a different, in a different way in different translations. Uh, the NRSV says, uh, in great anxiety. Uh, the English Standard Version says, uh, with great distress. Uh, the King James says, sorrowing. The Greek word is odenio. Odenio. And the reason that's an important word is Luke only uses that word twice in the entire gospel. Okay? The first time is here. The second time is in the story of the rich man and Lazarus. When the rich man is in Hades and he is being tortured and he calls out, Father Abraham, have mercy on me and send Lazarus to dip the tip of his finger in water and cool my tongue for I am in agony in these flames. And that word in agony is the Greek word odenio. That tells you just how incredibly deep was the anxiety level of Mary that she had, again, lost the Son of God, right? So, she's not angry at him. She, she, she says this, and maybe there's a little bit of harshness in her voice, but more of it is, is, I'm sure she was just mad at herself, you know? He said unto them, How is it that you have sought me? 
Wist ye not that I must be about my father's business? Didn't you know that I should be in my father's house? Is what he's saying. It's interesting because she said, Your father and I have sought you. And he said, My father wasn't searching for me. My father knew where I was. I've been in his house. Didn't you know that that's where I should be? And this gives us a great deal of insight into the humanity of Jesus, but also his divinity. He's starting to, as a child, understand who he is and whose he is. And understand his purpose. Um, Know that, yes, he was born as a child. He was born as a baby, right? As all of us are, right? And the fullness of God was pleased to dwell in him. But he was still, he was fully God, but he was also fully human. And the humanity of Jesus was just, was developing as humans do. With, uh, with divine attributes. But still, he was coming into his own. And this is what it says They understood not the saying which he spake unto them, lest we think that Jesus is a disobedient child, because God forbid that the Son of God would break a commandment such as honor your father and mother. It says that he went down with them and came to Nazareth and was subject to them. Because even though he is the Son of God, even though he is in the fullness of himself, fully God and fully human, He subjects himself to his parents. And it says, His mother kept all these sayings in her heart, and Jesus increased in wisdom and stature and in favor with God and man. Mary and Joseph were searching for the child, and they found him in his father's house. Now we, today, we seem to search for satisfaction in many things in hobbies, in sports, in our careers, in our families, in our relationships. We search for joy, but we find happiness and mistake it for joy. Happiness is dependent on our current situation, but joy is eternal. Happiness is external, and joy is internal. Happiness is from the things of the world, but joy is is from the things of God. Joy is a fruit of the Spirit. We're told in Galatians chapter 5 that the fruit of the Spirit is love, joy, peace, patience, kindness, goodness, faithfulness, gentleness, and self-control. Joy is a fruit of the Spirit. When we have the Spirit in us, we produce fruit which is joy. Joy is eternal. Joy is eternal. But we search Jesus told parables of people searching. The shepherd who had 99 sheep searched for the one that was lost. The woman who had 10 coins lost one and searched the house until she found it. In fact, the word is that he, she swept the house. That's how diligently she searched for that lost coin. Now these parables in Luke 15 speak of the joy of finding the lost. But Jesus was speaking of how the the shepherd would find the sheep and he would put it on his shoulders and go home rejoicing and say to his neighbors, Rejoice with me, for I have found this lost sheep. And in the same way, the woman who lost the coin, when she found it, she went to her neighbors and said, Rejoice with me, I have found this lost coin. See, rejoicing is the verb action of joy. Which means that if there is no joy, there is no rejoicing. There has to be joy before there is rejoicing. But rejoicing is an outpouring of the joy within us. God searches for us and He rejoices when we are found. In the same way, we are searching for something and when we find it in God, only when we find it in God, then we too rejoice. What are we searching for? We search for meaning. We search for the meaning of life. We search for happiness. We search for truth. 
All of these things are found only in the person of Jesus Christ. And where do we find Him? In our Father's house. We should start our search here. Are you searching for something? Are you searching for satisfaction? Are you searching for joy? Are you searching for meaning? Are you searching for truth? Why are you searching? Do you not know that He must be in His Father's house? Jesus' parents were searching with great anxiety, of course, because, again, they had lost the Son of God. Do we also search furtively, earnestly, anxiously, spending ourselves in the search with great anxiety? You know, we always say that the place where we find something that we're searching for is always the last place we look, right? Well, let's begin our search here in the Father's house. Let, us, let our search begin here, and here in the Father's house, we will find what it is that we are searching for. Let us pray. Almost gracious God, we, we are searching And we thank you, Lord, that in the arms of Christ we find what we are looking for. Augustine said that our souls are restless until they find their rest in you. And so let our search begin here in our Father's house. Let us be about our Father's business. Let us live our lives in such a way that the people in the world will see our light and be drawn out of darkness. There are people in this community, Lord, who don't know You. They came searching on on December 24th. They came searching for something. They didn't even know what it was they were searching for. And we welcomed them into our midst, but then they go out and they're still searching. They didn't even know when they had found it. So we pray, Lord, that You would, would enlighten all those who are seeking, that they would find what they are looking for in the arms of Christ. And that when we come to this place, we too will find what it is that we're searching for. That we too will find joy and we will go from this place, burst forth with rejoicing, pouring out the joy that we have in our hearts from knowing Jesus Christ as our Lord and our Savior, and we would pour out that joy on others. And that joy would infect our community and our homes and our neighborhoods, and that that the people would come and they would give themselves again to you and to your teaching. May our children be raised to know Jesus Christ as Lord. May may our children be raised to know the truth in your holy word and not be turned aside by the lies of the world, by the lies of the social media and those things. We just pray, Lord, that they would be close to our families and that they would look to us for guidance rather than to their friends and to the internet. We pray, Lord, for, for a revival to happen in this church and in this community so that we could pour forth our faith and our joy on a world in desperate need of those things. All this we pray in the mighty name of Jesus Christ. And Lord, may you be glorified in all of this. Amen and amen. Thank you for joining us on this edition of Guerrilla Christianity. My hope and prayer is that this time of listening to and learning from God's Word has blessed you as much as it has blessed me putting this message together. Now, I have been blessed that God has called me to minister to two churches in rural New Jersey, Ebenezer United Methodist Church in Auburn and Hudson United Methodist Church in Pettertown. And if you don't have a church family to call your own, I'd like to invite you to join us on Sunday mornings. We are a Bible-believing, gospel-preaching, Christ-adoring faith community in the heart of New Jersey's farmland. But if you don't live nearby, get involved with the church where you are. We are not called to be Christians in isolation, but in community. So I would encourage you to live out your faith with a group of like-minded believers where you are. 
Again, I pray that you have been blessed by this teaching, and I hope that you will join us again next time. God bless you and keep you. Amen. Amen.